Welcome to my harrowing story with my lady's calamity and Lilith and all the tragedies I had to go through. I've got five stories here, so just bear with me. Chapter One, Wolfbeard. Several years ago, I lived through a series of horrifying and hilarious events with a beard in the wild. At the time, everything I was put through was rather overwhelming and even scary at times, but now I can look back on it and laugh. I hope you get a chuckle out of it too. Without further ado, I will give you the first tale of Wolfbeard. I call him such because he has an unhealthy obsession with wolves. He was one of those guys that collected just about anything with artwork of wolves on it, shirts, blankets, tapestries, you name it. His obsession went far beyond this, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. This will be mentioned in the story. I met Wolfbeard in my freshman year of university. At the time, he was engaged to my now ex-childhood friend. My friend and I have taken to calling her Miss Piggy these days, so we'll use that name for this story. Miss Piggy was your classic legbeard, morbidly obese, lacking proper social boundaries, and an extreme weebo extraordinary when I was much younger, I lived in the same town as Miss Piggy. She wasn't always a full-blown legbeard. Maybe it was the nostalgia glasses kicking in, but in my younger childhood years, I remember her being around the same build as me, slender and on the tall side. And despite being a little socially awkward, who wasn't in their childhood years, she was a super sweet and funny girl. We had been best friends since kindergarten. We only saw each other rarely. And our interest in lives changed. However, once I finished primary school and went off to university with a license and a car I decided to change this with a vehicle the 30 minute distance was nothing so I began reaching out to her in an attempt to rekindle our old friendship and in doing so I ended up meeting Wolfbeard at the time Miss Piggy and Wolfbeard had been living together in a tiny one bedroom apartment interestingly though both of their parents had been against the idea of it and they didn't believe that either one of them was ready for that kind of response they were right, of course, but I'm getting ahead of myself again. The apartment was in one of those sketchy complexes, you know, the one that you really don't want to be caught in after dark. The place was a dump, and the area was constantly filled with a cacophony, unsupervised children terrorizing the neighborhood, and white trash couples screaming at each other and slamming furniture around. I almost turned around on the spot before making it to Piggy's apartment, but I had been the one to make the plans to meet up, so I strengthened my resolve and I knocked on their scuffed and dented door. I should also mention that she had not told me about Wolfbeard, let alone that they were living together. So I almost backpedaled on the spot when a tall, greasy-haired man opened the door instead of my friend. Wolfbeard was a big man, and I mean that in every sense of the word. He was tall, easily around six foot one or two, as well as morbidly obese. He nearly filled the entire door frame, blocking the apartment within from view. He had dirty blonde hair, and although he lacked the true neckbeard, he had a very poorly trimmed splotch of scruff right on his chin. This made him appear as though Shaggy from Scooby-Doo had really let himself go. He wore an oversized t-shirt with the print of two wolves howling at the moon and one of those flat golf caps atop his clearly unwashed hair. But what was most off-putting about this imposing figure was his smell. His chapped lips pulled into a smile, revealing plaque encrusted teeth and a wave of horrific odor blasted my face. Vomit-inducing as this was, it didn't hold a candle to his body odor. In all my time knowing Wolfbeard, I don't think he ever once grasped the concept of deodorant. You could always smell him coming before you see him. And with someone his size, that's really saying something. Before I could scuttle away, Miss Piggy waddled up and pushed Wolfbeard out of the way so she could greet me. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I forgot to mention to you that Wolfbeard, he's my fiance. <laughs> She squealed in delight, forcing a pudgy hand into my face, showing off one of those etched rune-looking rings, the one that you could find at Spencer's or Hot Topics. A little overwhelmed and caught off guard, I said, Congratulations! 
before entering the apartment. When I got inside, I had to stop myself from almost retching again. You see, Miss Piggy had always been a bit of a hoarder, even since we were children, but time had certainly not helped this habit, and what's worse, Wolfbeard was a lazy slob who had previously relied on his mother to clean up after him, so his mess just compounded the problem. The whole place smelled vaguely of garbage and cat pee. The living room was made up of a couch, coffee table, and a massive television vision that Wolfbeard had brought from his parents' house. Both the couch and the coffee table was piled with clothes, garbage, and who knows what else. I could really feel the impact of the clutter. The unit truly was tiny. In entirety, the unit was laid out in a linear line, one room connected to the next. It consisted of the front living room, then moved into the kitchen, and the dining space. The kitchen was pretty narrow, and it seemed even worse than it really was, as the mountain of unwashed dishes coated in rock and food, took up what little counter space there was, and crammed opposite of this was a table that was functionally useless due to the mountain of crap piled atop. Continuing our glum tour, we had the piece de resistance, the single bedroom and connected bathroom. Based on the descriptions of the rest of the unit, I will let you imagine as to the state of this tiny, overstuffed room, and the smell from which it emanated. Needless to say, the apartment was disgusting, and it only added to the general feeling of uneasiness during the visit. From the very beginning, Wolfbeard made me incredibly uncomfortable. Despite supposedly being engaged to Miss Piggy, from the moment I entered the apartment, he was eyeing me like a piece of meat. For this thrilling saga, we'll refer to myself as Calamity, my usual D&D moniker. Appropriate given that this whole experience felt more like a wildly crafted fantasy than a reality. While I'm by no means some sort of supermodel, I do try to put a bit of effort into my appearance. I'm rather busty, despite being slender, and I'm quite tall, a little over 5'8". My friends often make Amazon warrior jokes at me, but I just threaten to crush their skulls like sparrow eggs. I also love all things horror and occult, so naturally, I'm into witchy, alternative style, and I love to dress in dark makeup and clothing, so oftentimes, this puts off or spooks away potential creeps, which is great, but in Wolfbeard's case, it makes me appear as some sort of tantalizing mystery that he desperately wants to unwrap. He said, You need to find a man seeing that you're in the golf like me. Although, I'm more in the classical. You need a nice big guy, much like myself, to protect you. Anyways, after bulldozing some of the crap off the couch, Wolfbeard made a sweeping motion to gesture Miss Piggy and I to sit down. Upon reluctantly doing so, I was dismayed to find Wolfbeard planting himself on the ground next to me, rather than his fiance, leaning back on the couch, uncomfortably close to me. Despite the discomfort of his looming presence, eventually my nose was blinded by the lingering cloud of stench, and I was actually able to enjoy catching up with Miss Piggy, despite having become even even more awkward and overly invested in anime, she still seemed to be much the same person from all those years ago, and chatting with her was fun. It was odd though, and every so often, Miss Piggy and Wolfbeard would have these strange little exchanges. Wolfbeard would frown and grab his chest dramatically for a moment, or briefly clutch his head in his hands before shooting a dire look at Miss Piggy. In turn, she paced a worried expression on her face and extended a gentle hand as to reassure him that every Everything was all right. I didn't know what was going on, and I assumed it was some weird couple thing between them, so I tried my best to ignore it. That is until right around nightfall. Noticing the sky beginning to darken, Wolfbeard dramatically stood up and waddled to the window. Once again, he dramatically grasped his chest and violently whipped his head away. At this, Miss Piggy shot up from the couch and bounded over to him, clutching onto him much like a pose from an old romance novel. Confused, I watched the scene beginning to unfold before me. Are you going to be all right, my love? Miss Piggy softly cooed, looking over her shoulder at the night air beyond the window. It's a full moon tonight, Wolfbeard hoarsely croaked in response, dramatically turning away from her. You can control it! I know you can! Miss Piggy warbled, clutching him tighter still. I should go, just to be safe. 
Wolfbeard whispered back. At this, he strode through the apartment in almost a slow motion fashion. I imagine he thought that he looked really epic or something, but in reality, he just looked like some kind of wounded animal hauling itself back into a den to die. Upon reaching the door, he paused in the frame, looked at me sadly, then with a sigh, he closed the door behind him. At this point, I'm thinking to myself, okay, what the heck is going on? And that's when Miss Piggy comes up to me with a direly serious look on her face. Calamity, I need to tell you a secret. Promise not to tell anyone because Wolfbeard, he could be in serious danger if you tell anyone. So please take this serious. I paused, not sure what other horrors that possibly could be awaiting me that evening, but the curiosity got the better of me, so I agreed. Wolfbeard is a lichen. I was positively bamboozled, blinked furiously, as my brain tried to process the sheer stupidity that a grown woman had thrown my way. Mistaking this for me not understanding, she continued. Lichen, it's what most people call a werewolf. You're telling me that Wolfbeard is a werewolf? I repeated slowly, in one last ditch effort to make sure I wasn't misunderstanding some sort of joke or prank. Yes. Miss Piggy whispered, no hint of humor on her face. Usually Wolfbeard can control himself, but it's a full moon tonight and he has to transform. So we're afraid that he might lose control. It took every ounce of self-restraint in my body not to burst out laughing on the spot. I couldn't tell at the time, and still don't know to this day, if it was just one of those weird socially awkward games that the two of them were playing together, or if she genuinely believed him. But either way, what ensued was positively wild. Miss Piggy proceeded to tell me the tale of how she learned Wolfbeard's oh-so-dark secret back in high school, and how they had fallen in love, because she had learned how to tame the beast in his heart. Mind you, all the while this is going on, Wolfbeard has started making this ridiculous growling noise and knocking things about in the closed off bedroom. After a few minutes of this, I could hear the sound of the window sliding and a resounding thud. At this, Miss Piggy quickly led me alongside her to investigate. I should clarify, they lived on the ground floor. In the bedroom was one large window that lacked a screen and it opened directly to the parking lot. Well, lo and behold, when Miss Piggy and I arrived in the bedroom, the window was open, and there was no sign of our dashing lycanthropic gentle sir. At this point, I had reached my quota of how much bullcrap I can handle in one evening, so I used the excuse of needing to go back to my dorm for school the next day, and I take my leave. I told Miss Piggy how nice it was to catch up with her, and that the wolfbeard secret was safe with me, and I quickly gathered my things. However, as I neared the front door, before I could reach it, it burst open. Standing in the door away was Wolfbeard once more. He's now panting wildly and dripping with sweat. If he thought he smelled bad before, he was now positively noxious. He also had what looked like some dirt quickly rubbed on his forearms, as if meant to convince me that he'd been out terrorizing the countryside in the five minutes he's been out of the apartment. Feeding into his delusion, Miss Piggy ran into his arms and coddled him like he just escaped a harrowing experience. She asked him if his transformation was painful, and he just pathetically nodded in response. He turned to me with what I imagined he thought was collected coolness, and he ran his hand through his sweat-soaked hair and addressed me. I hope I didn't scare you, Calamity. I know I could get a little primal during Moon Phase. Oh no, Miss Piggy told me you know how to control yourself. I responded, knowing dang well that it wasn't good to play into their game, but honestly, not knowing how else to end the situation, before he had a chance to start up a new element of the game. At this, he held out his sweaty, stinky, dirt-encrusted arm as to expect me to hug him. There was quite possibly nothing else on the earth that I wanted to do less than hug him, so I was quick to dodge him, and I blamed it on not wanting the dirt on his arms to get on my clothes. His response to this is to literally throw his shoulders down and to pout like an overgrown toddler. And with 100% seriousness and no irony, he said, Aw, oh, sad panda. 
It seemed to become a passionate mission of Wolfbeard to try to get as close to me as possible and to try to touch me as much as he physically could any time I encountered him. And believe it or not, this evening was not the worst part of my encounter with him. Oh no. Despite being engaged, Wolfbeard would soon decide that he wanted more than just friendship with yours truly. But that's another story to come. Chapter 2, Wolfbeard Returns Today's entry is one of drama, suspense, non-reciprocal feelings, and a rejection-fueled temper tantrum of beardy proportions. And with that, let us begin. Since my fate-altering encounter with the mighty werewolf, I had conscientiously made an effort to try making plans to meet up with Miss Piggy in neutral locations, or whenever Wolfbeard was away. Of course, it wasn't always possible to avoid him. When it came to me being in the general vicinity of his town, he was like a truffle pig catching my scent. He had the most uncanny ability to somehow sense my presence and materialize in said location as if by magic. Miss Piggy and I out to lunch? Oh wow, what are you two doing here? What a coincidence. Mind if I join you? Miss Piggy invites me to come over to hang out at her apartment, while Wolfbeard is supposed to be working until 6. Oh wow, I just happened to get off work early again. What are the odds I'd find you over here? Don't mind if I do, joining you on the girls' day. Now mind you, if his work situations were anything otherwise, I genuinely might believe that this was a coincidence. However, Wolfbeard worked for his wealthy father. So basically, whenever he felt like being done with the work for the day, he was done. And he always decided that he was done when I was there. I genuinely tried, you guys. I tried so hard to be friendly with this man, because he's going to be married to my childhood friend. But god dang it, he made it hard. There were only so many excuses I could accept for his blatantly creepy and downright inappropriate behavior before I came to the inevitable conclusion that I would never feel comfortable around this person and that I needed to at least try and warn Miss Piggy from what I could only see as becoming a disaster of a marriage and a broken heart. Now before anyone gets too far into thinking, gee calamity, he may be feeding Miss Piggy the delusion of him actually being a werewolf, but that's hardly hurting her and doesn't warrant trying to interfere with their future marriage. I get ya. If that was it, I'd let them play their Princess Mononoke into the sunset. No, what bothered me enough to try to talk this woman out of engagement was the blatant attempt to cheat on her right before her very eyes. Somewhere along the way, Wolfbeard had decided that he was never really in love with Miss Piggy. I would find this out later from word of his own mouth, but early on, it was apparent that he had decided that I would be the new object of his desire, whether I returned the sentiment or not. We're talking about a man that growled at dogs while passing in the street, and dramatically clutching at his heart when anyone spoke of nighttime or the moon. He clearly was a true master of subtlety. All sarcasm aside, Wolfbeard blatantly began attempting to put the moves on me about three visits in. Anytime I was over, he would always go out of his way to get as physically close to me as possible, stepping in as close as he possibly can to try to make your personal bubble to shrink, and to shrink it about three more inches. Got it? Okay, now imagine the person invading your said bubble being significantly larger than you, looming as near as you can feel their hot rotten breath on your neck, and catch every whiff of their potent body odor. Their large moist arms occasionally brushing you due to them standing so close and make sure that you are getting an ample dose of their sweat. They squeeze your arm or your wrist with their large soggy hand with every other word. And most importantly, you can't forget that since they loom over you so, they are in the perfect position to stare down your shirt at your cleavage at every chance they get when they think your eyes are not directly on them. Uncomfortable yet? I'm sorry my brave soldiers. But we've only just begun, and the war has many horrors yet to come. Alongside Wolfbeard's frequent soggy squeezes, he likes to try his hand at sweet talking. He constantly say things like, You'll make some man very happy someday, and I envy that lucky jerk. And, golf checks are the sexiest. But his all-time favorite poetics to fall back on were extremely uncomfortable comments directly regarding my body. 
He would scan me up and down with his greedy little pin eyes and say things like, Oh girl, your tits are so spectacular in that shirt. Or, Honey, that top shows off all the right curves. The wildest part of this is that he would make those vulgar comments in the most ridiculous effeminate voice possible, while wobbling his head back and forth and snapping his wrist, as if he thought the most over-the-top stereotype of a gay man made it funny, and that it made it totally appropriate and A-OK -okay to say it not only in front of my face, but in the presence of his own fiance. But well, perhaps the wildest thing of all this, that Miss Piggy was not only alright with this behavior, but she actually defended them. That's right. The few times I had alone with her, I blatantly told her how uncomfortable Wolfbeard made me, and that she shouldn't put up with him openly flirting with other women, because she was worth more than that. But she'd always counter with, Oh, he was only joking. <laughs> Basically, for every concern I raised, she had an excuse prepared and was at the ready. So after going back and forth with Miss Piggy countless times about it, I finally accepted that if she wanted to marry this creep that openly ogled other women and would without a doubt cheat on her, the very second the opportunity presented itself, she would. As much as I cared about the well-being of Miss Piggy's heart after rekindling our old friendship, I also recognized a lost cause, and I had to accept that it was not my circus and it was not my sweaty, unkempt monkeys. So my compromise was simple. I would stop bringing it up to Miss Piggy, but I did not want to be around Wolfbeard anymore. Whenever humanly possible. Despite how she defended him, I furiously maintained how uncomfortable he made me. And to my surprise, Miss Piggy actually agreed. So over the next couple of weeks, when I saw Miss Piggy, she either came over to my place, or we met somewhere outside of her town, and seemingly outside of Wolfbeard's sphere of influence. It was fantastic. The uncomfortable aura of hungry eyes boring into me, it was gone. So I truly was able to enjoy catching up with lost time with my friend. It was hugely apparent that our interests had become widely different, but as we spent the majority of our time simply filling each other in on how our lives, families, and towns have changed over the years, this really wasn't a problem. I did start to notice a disturbing theme, however of every cringy change and harebrained ill-advised decision that she made since leaving high school was somehow linked to Wolfbeard's influence. That being said, these brief few weeks of reprieve were the calm before the storm. The summer quarter had just rolled around, and since we weren't taking class then, it was my vacation. This meant I went back home to my parents' place. That was much closer to Miss Piggy's, and I had a whole lot of free time. Taking advantage of this new spare time, Miss Piggy invited me out to her place for the first time in weeks. I was obviously apprehensive about it, but agreed when she assured me that Wolfbeard would be gone for a whole weekend. As he was on a camping trip with his father, I was also a bit easier to warm up at this point, because another friend of mine agreed to come with me. And who doesn't love introducing their old friends to the new friends? The more the merrier. My other friend, who I'll call Lilith, her D&D moniker. I guess I'll be sticking to this nickname theme. She's still one of my best friends to this day. We met after I moved into my old town, and we rode through the absolute wilderness that was our edgy high school emo years together. When you get through that kind of crap together, you'll either want to forget it ever existed, or you'll be blood brothers for life. We are both grown adults now, who practically live in replicas of the Adams Family House though. So maybe the phase will never entirely leave us? or didn't hit as hard, like a slow burn that permanently infects us. But I digress. We're a couple of spooky awesome witches that ride or die together. And god dang it if Wolfbeard didn't make us ride through hell. So Lilith and I piled into my car and made our trip over to Miss Piggy's. I already warned her about the filthy state of the place, and you better believe I told her about the Wolfbeard nonsense. But rather than be apprehensive, Lilith maintained an incredibly amused air about the whole thing. Lilith is a creature that mastered all 12 circles of sass, and is an entity I suspect to be composed of nothing but sheer concentrated spite. So I got the impression that she was actually disappointed that the beard would not be available for viewing in his natural habitat. However, to her delight, things that evening would take a turn for the worse. You see? When I pulled into the parking lot, that oh-so-familiar battle zone of an apartment complex, I spotted not one, but two cars in front of Miss Piggy's unit. There was Miss Piggy's car, and next to it, 
Plain as day was Wolfbeard's car. A wave of rage burbled up over me and I froze in my tracks. I no longer wanted to participate in this visit. Lilith, however, she looked positively ecstatic and she grabbed my arm, yanking me toward the unit. When I finally got to the door, I knocked a little harder than usual. My irritation was apparent. However, Miss Piggy didn't seem to pick up on it in the slightest. And when she opened the door, there oozing proudly on the couch was none other than Wolfbeard. Lilith nearly looked like Christmas had come early, hoping beyond hope to see him bark or climb out another window. I, however, was not in a good mood about the matter. A little curtly, I asked Miss Piggy. Uh, I thought Wolfbeard was joining his dad on a camping trip this weekend, Piggy. Oh, well, he was, but when I told him you were coming over today, he decided to come over instead. <laughs> the way she said it was as if nothing was slightly unusual. This practically made my blood run cold. Was I living in the Twilight Zone? Why the heck would Miss Piggy tell Wolfbeard I was coming over when I expressly told her that he made me uncomfortable and I didn't want to see him? What's more, why was she okay with him seemingly being so enamored with me that he'd cancel out on a trip with his dad that previously he was super excited about? This whole thing did not sit right with me. As per usual, the moment I entered into the room, Wolfbeard's eyes laser focused directly onto my chest. However, moments later, his gaze shifted to the new figure behind me. Upon spotting Lilith, it was his turn to look like Christmas had come. Hello, my darling calamity, he chirped, picking up that stupid effeminate mock accent again. I must say you look positively appetizing as usual. The way he said appetizing, dang near set the hairs on the back of my neck standing straight up. He shifted into what I imagined he thought was a seductive position on the sofa, and he narrowed his eyes at me. But I must say, who is the absolute snack behind you? Lilith shot me a glance of pure euphoric amusement at what her eyes were witnessing before stepping forward and introducing herself. Hi, I'm Lilith. I'm Calamity's friend from high school. It's nice to meet you. There was absolutely no subtlety when Wolfbeard's eyes shifted right down Lilith's cleavage. If my tall and slender frame is busty, Lilith is shorter and curvier and positively voluptuous, to say the least. And oftentimes, her choice of wardrobe only emphasizes this. It was all too much for the poor beard. Sensing a new female in his territory, the mighty wolf beard begins his usual courting rituals, prying himself off the sofa like a wad of chewing gum baked in the sun. He waddled to the side to usher my ladies to the now vacant seats. Gallant as he likely saw the act, the clearly defined sweaty butt print that he left seared on the fabric of the sofa left us more than a little hesitant to take a seat. So instead, we opted to sit in a circle on the living room carpet. To precisely no one's surprise, Wolfbeard quickly worked to shove himself between Lilith and I. He sat crisscross while leaning back, his arms coming behind, and dangerously close to touching Lilith and I. The next hour proceeded to be painfully slow and filled with an obscene amount of increasingly vulgar jokes and comments from Wolfbeard. It seemed that as much fun as Lilith had initially thought it would be, this beard was far more powerful than she had first anticipated. He was a creature of darker magics, older magics, and these unholy forces broke through her seemingly impenetrable, war-hardened, emotional battle armor, leaving her shifting uncomfortably and looking at me for escape. At this, I took my window of opportunity to flee, I told Miss Piggy. Uh, hey Piggy, um, Lilith and I have something that, that's just come up and uh, we really have to go. She seemed a little disappointed by the sudden departure, but accepted and bid us farewell. However, it was Wolfbeard that really seemed to be the most upset by this. His shoulders dropped and he looked down at the floor. His dirty golf cap cast a heavy shadow on his round face. You really have to go so soon? He asked in a quivering voice. Yeah, sorry about that. I responded with zero interest in the feeding into his act. At this, with great effort, he worked his way back up into a standing position before beginning to waddle in our direction. Oh, that's a real shame, he almost whispered. I gave up spending time in the great wilderness to be able to hang out with you. 
You should know what a big deal that is to me. I kind of need to run wild and free in the forest. It's in my blood. It helps us keep control of the beast. Lilith shot me a look, but he kept approaching us. Well, at the very least, you can give me a hug before you go. Before I could protest, his moist, flabby arms were crushing around me, <gasps> pinning my arms to my side. I was enveloped in a cloud of body odor that I previously never would have thought possible, and I had to fight the powerful urge to retch. He squeezed way too hard, as if to smash me as close to him as possible, before finally releasing me from his bear trap. Then approached Lilith with the same expectancy, despite her literally just meeting him. She, however, wasn't quick enough to evade him, and found herself smashed into the same stinking embrace that I had just been in moments before. As soon as she was released, the two of us fled to my car. However, over my shoulder I called, Piggy, can you join us for just a moment? Quickly, she hurried out around the corner. Once there, I started to open up the floodgates on her. I'm really irritated that Wolfbeard was here, especially after you all but promised that he wouldn't be here. I'm sick and tired of all of the gross comments he constantly makes and how he tries to touch me all of the time. And it's not just me. He's been making Lilith uncomfortable as well. I didn't want to have to be around Wolfbeard again if he couldn't control himself. The scene must have looked intense to any onlookers. We're on the Pacific Northwest, so even though it was in the beginning of summertime, it was a gray and cloudy day, and it had begun to pour down heavy rain. However, the drama turned up even more. We heard what sounded like a cross between a wounded cry and an attempt to howl like a wolf. <laughs> I looked out across the window to the corner of the building. Wolfbeard had crept out behind Miss Piggy, and he had been listening in on our discussion. Apparently, my declaration of not wanting him near me, unless he refrained from attempting to grope me, was far too painful of a blow, as he dramatically ran off toward the wooded trail. Seeing this, Miss Piggy legitimately stifled a sob, and she cried after him to come back. But it was no use. The Alpha Beard had fled into the woods beyond, likely already transforming into a powerful beast of brood in the shadows. Seeing Miss Piggy in near hysterics, Lilith and I felt like we had no choice but to take her back inside and try to calm her down. She starts rambling and raving about his condition. We can't leave him alone like that out there. When he transforms upset, he can be reckless and can get himself caught. It's not safe. <laughs> she sobbed. After 15 minutes of consoling a distraught Miss Piggy, her phone rang. To seemingly no one else but Miss Piggy's surprise, it was Wolfbeard. She dramatically cooed into the phone at him, asking him where he was and if he was okay. Having trouble hearing him, she switched the phone to speaker mode. What met her ears next was the most pathetic croak I've ever heard. Piggy, I need help. My transformation was too quick and emotional and I lost control. I ran wild and aimless in my pain and somehow I've got myself stuck. I ran into the clay flat and the rain has made it like a tar pit. I'm stuck and my transformations weakened me too much to get out. Please help me. I'm growing weaker yet. He dramatically finished before hanging up the call. At this, Miss Piggy went nuts again, screaming, we need to call the police or the ambulance to come rescue him. It took 10 more minutes to calm her down, and she only did this after I called her brother to ask him to go check the woods. He agreed, and Miss Piggy calmed down enough that Lilith and I had felt that it was okay to finally leave. I didn't know what happened to Wolfbeard, but I knew it wasn't anything as dramatic as he made it seem, and I didn't want to play into his ploy for attention, as being seen as waiting for him upon his return. Though I wasn't there for his retrieval, Miss Piggy's brother is actually pretty normal and a nice dude. Later called me to tell me the harrowing journey. And oh, what a journey it was. You see, it was raining something awful that day, and it did make the trails terribly mucky. But there was no dangerous tar pit like Clay Flat that can trap emotionally distressed werewolves. No. When Miss Piggy's brother went to check on the trail, he found Wolfbeard face down in a literal mud puddle, his phone in his hand dramatically held out in front of him, as if he gave out to the elements while calling for help. Apparently, he was none too happy to see Miss Piggy's brother there instead of us, and all but made him single-handedly yank his oversized girth out of the puddle himself. 
To this day, I can't get the mental image out of my head of this grown man plotting out a plan to make these heartless women feel bad and that they should apologize and spend all their extra time with him, stalking through the rain and windswept back trails of the forest, searching for the perfect mud puddle, and then carefully nestling himself face down in it, careful to keep his phone clean. The sight must have been spectacular, but I digress. This was just the first of Wolfbeard's spectacular tantrums, and this was before he even confessed his feelings about Milady. You see, he didn't give up easy, and as if beaching himself in a shallow slope puddle wasn't enough, he'd have to try a different approach to force me to love him. But that is another story for another day. I'll catch you all again the next time in part 3. Chapter 3, Wolfbeard, the Bionic Heartbreaker Today's tale continues the epic saga of our favorite Lupine Neckbeard and his quest to court Milady. When last we left off, Wolfbeard had attempted to beach himself in a mud puddle on the forest trail behind the apartment complex after hearing me say how much I disliked the gross comments and how I didn't want to be around him anymore. A lesser beard may have given up and decided I was a dumb hoe that just wanted to find a chad to hop on like the others. But Wolfbeard was a persistent one and he had no intentions of giving up the hunt without his prize. Some time had passed and I did not speak to or see Miss Piggy for a while. She had kind of broken my trust in her with the last Wolfbeard incident, and I needed some time to cool off. It also didn't help that my friend Lilith had definitely not hit it off with Miss Piggy. Right from the get-go, she said something like, Um, I'm really getting some bad vibes off that girl. Be careful. Something I should have listened to about her, but I had to find it out the hard way later. At the time, I thought it was just a little bit of rivalry. Miss Piggy definitely wasn't warm toward Lilith. She seemed to feel as though the fact that we had been friends longer, since kindergarten, automatically made her my sole and dearest best friend. And my attempts to rekindle our old friendship was proof of this. However, Lilith and I are very close, and it's plain for anyone to see. I can't tell you the amount of times that people have actually mistaken us for literal sisters. Since this clearly challenged Miss Piggy's perceived status, she was on her guard from the start. What's most fascinating to me, however, was that though Miss Piggy turned a willful blind eye toward Wolfbeard's seeming apparent infatuation with me, but in the sight of the same behaviors directed toward Lilith, it burned her up. Over the course of the evening we had been over there, every time Wolfbeard would make a gross comment directed toward Lilith, instead of directing her anger at Wolfbeard, Piggy would shoot daggers into Lilith from across the room. Generally, Lilith is a really nice person. She's hilarious and mischievous and will battle to the literal death for your honor if she cares for you. But if you get on the girl's bad side, you will think that Satan himself has personally targeted you and Lilith really didn't like Miss Piggy. It was only out of her respect for me that she promised to restrain herself and to continue to make an effort to be cordial. But let's just say that the diplomacy was shaky. So, it was after this dry spell for a little over over a week with no communication, since a puddle incident, that I suddenly got a phone call. I didn't recognize the number, but it was a local area code, and I was expecting some calls that day, so I answered. But when the familiar husky voice on the other end of the line met my ears, I nearly hung up on the spot. It was Wolfbeard, restraining my shock and anger at him calling me, despite me having never given him my number, I allowed him to speak for a moment. How calamity. Can I talk to you for a moment? Wolfbeard, how did you get my number? I questioned as calmly as I could manage. Oh, Miss Piggy gave it to me. I needed to talk to you so I could apologize. I was suspicious, but surprised nonetheless, so I allowed him to continue. I've reflected on my behavior a lot lately, and I realize I've treated you very badly. I really like you a lot, and I don't want to destroy our friendship. W would you please accept my apology and allow me to start over? I really want things to be good between Miss Piggy's friends and me. 
He sounded genuinely sincere, and I was truly caught off guard. Of all of my experience with neckbeards, I've never known owning up to their bad behavior and apologizing to be within their realm of understanding, and I still really did want to make things good between us especially if Miss Piggy was truly set on marrying him, and if he was going to actually make a change and make an effort, I decided to give him a chance. Over the weeks that followed, he did actually make a change in his behavior. He had finally stopped making gross comments, and he had stopped trying to touch me as frequently. Mind you, he still had boundary issues, and he loomed too close, and he still had a fear of deodorant, but things were much better, at least for a while. See, once I made the mistake of expressing an above average interest in something in Wolfbeard's presence, that said thing became his whole life. Said thing was a small band or group of performers. They were called the Steam Power Draft. They have a fun, timey, vaudeville sound to their music and they stick to this whole steampunk robotic theme. All the band members and performers, they dress up in intricate steampunk robot or mad scientist style costume, and they play in character. In between songs, they have little skits in character, and they interact with the audience. It's super fun, because they highly encourage the audience to participate, as in, they encourage them to create their own in-universe characters, and to show up to the event in costume and play along. It was a really fun and unique experience, and I was already an avid cosplayer. It really appealed to me. The topic came up during a group meeting. I had reluctantly agreed to go despite knowing Wolfbeard would be there, because several other friends I didn't get to see often was going to be there. Both are super dear friends to me still to this day. The first was Doe. You guessed it, another D&D moniker. She had met Miss Piggy shortly after I moved away. She was friends with her through middle school, but she began to distance herself a bit when Miss Piggy met Wolfbeard. However, it seemed that she too had an interest in rekindling an old friendship, thus her appearance at the lunch meetup. Doe would also have the misfortune of later becoming Miss Piggy's roommate, but that's a whole different story, and perhaps I can convince her to share her own stories about that. The other girl joining was Valor. She had no previous connections to Miss Piggy or Wolfbeard. She's someone I met and befriended online. I later learned that she was also a college student in the same state. Our schedules made it really hard to hang out. So when I learned that we were both free, I invited her to join the group outing. I thought it would be safe enough, given Wolfbeard's recent attempt at adjusting his behavior and the sheer number of people in our group. Let's just say that although Wolfbeard stayed true to his word, he found entirely new ways to make the whole room full of women uncomfortable. With the exception of Miss Piggy, of course. After the initial greetings, where Wolfbeard tried to force a stinking hug on each one of the female guests in the group, he came upon Valor for the first time. Her saving grace was she was already in a long-term relationship with her then-girlfriend, now fiancé. I think you realize that since this new milady was not only taken, but also taken by another milady? meant that she would be much more work to be convinced of his charms. So he spared her the more aggressive courting in favor of the other damsels in need of saving in the group. As I'm sure one can imagine by now, Wolfbeard was not an easy specimen to attempt having a conversation around. He had a thing with needing to not only participate in every conversational topic that arose, but to domineer it, even if he had to make up some ridiculous story to do so. One of the ladies shared a story saying something like, It was so cool. This one time we met Elijah Wood at the Space Needle restaurant, and he was nice enough to let me get a quick picture on my way out. Better one-up that. Who could forget the time when I ran into Morgan Freeman at Barnes & Noble? The time that really actually truly happened, and we spoke for over an hour. I taught Mr. Freeman a whole new stance on philosophy. And in thanks... He swore he'd never forget me. I expressed myself by saying something like, I would love to try singing and songwriting as a hobby. Oh, you better believe Wolfbeard had a story. I was offered a contract for Universal Records for my heavenly voice, but it wasn't my dream, so I turned them down. I could go on and on for hours about this story, but this is already getting long and I haven't even started the main events. Wolfbeard is the truest example of a pathological liar that I have ever, and to this day, have ever met. I suppose trying to convince me that he was a literal werewolf 
Should have been a warning sign, but I digress. He could weave these insanely intricate stories and do it completely impromptu, and they weren't short little blurbs. He crafted a story that was five or plus minutes long, and he could do so naturally as one breathes. I struggled just lying well enough to not spoil surprises to my friends, so I can't even imagine the process he had going on in his brain. Well, after dealing with Wolfbeard butting into our conversation for the last 30 minutes, Doe, Valor, and I shifted our body language a tad, and we formed a bit of a circle, effectively closing Wolfbeard off, before beginning a new topic we assumed that he wouldn't know anything about, that being the small band I mentioned earlier. The three of us were really having fun with it. We decided to make our own steampunk robot costumes for the upcoming concert. We then talked about the band a little more, and we agreed on a mutual favorite robot. That has to be the spine. The tall, silver, and black robot with big battle spines Johnny out of his back? He's in that swanky, roaring 20s inspired group. He has this super sexy deep voice. Mmm. He plays that exasperated straight man to the group of otherwise goofy and hyperactive characters. That's a trope I live for. Sensing the miladies taking an interest in another male, even an entirely fictional android one, and that was just a stage act, was unacceptable. He must have thought, I need to move with haste before I lose my ladies to those wicked robot overlords. You see, I was foolish in assuming that he wouldn't know anything about the band. I had been posting about them occasionally on my various social media accounts because I was excited about the upcoming concert. And should I really have expected Wolfbeard to not be stalking every account I owned, especially the ones that weren't strictly private? Oh no, he knew exactly who they were, and apparently, he dug through every piece of media he could get his hands on, and attempted to woo me with his knowledge. So, you better believe that he jutted into the conversation right at that very moment, breaking out his handy dandy fake effeminate voice once more. Oh, that spine is just so sexy. He barked loudly from across the table, snapping his fingers in a zigzag motion, thus attracting looks from the surrounding tables. He then straightened his back up and brought a hand to his chest, gripping an invisible tie in an attempt to mimic the spine's signature pose, turning his head slightly to the right, striking an eerie grin, and pulling his golf hat lower trying to cast a shadow over his eyes, similarly to how Spine's fedora did. Yeah, the Spine legitimate war fedora. But believe it or not, when you get a well-fitted one with a wide enough brim that doesn't make you look like a fat head with a baby hat, and you pair it with a masterfully tailored suit and vest, rather than repulse, it actually does magical things. But that pitiful golf hat and ill-fitted trench coat? It had the opposite effect, not to mention his charming grin. It made the whole picture look quite deranged. If it wasn't bad enough, he then switched from the effeminate voice to as deep a voice as he can force himself, trying his best to mimic the robot's smooth voice and mannerisms. I don't really like to use the word cringy to describe things, but there is really no other way to describe the immense discomfort that this absurd behavior gave us. What's worse is that he continued to talk in this voice for the rest of the meal, as well as every time I saw him for the next few weeks, and he also didn't stop mimicking the spine's body posture and mannerisms. I guess being a werewolf wasn't cool enough for him anymore, because now he wanted to identify as an android. The moment that he insinuated that he'd like to go to the concert and chaperone the lovely ladies, we quickly changed the topic, and shortly after, we finished the lunch and fled. A few days later, I wound back up at Miss Piggy's apartment to hang out with her and Doe. Doe and I got to chatting about the progress on our costumes. I'm a bit of a seamstress, and I love making crazy costumes. For my robot, I did this Victorian bustle skirt. You know, the ones that make women look like they have massive rears. That's because of all the ruffles, and the literal pillow that you have tied around your butt. It was knee length in the front, and it was floor length in the back. It was a huge effort and it cost me way more than I wanted to spend in materials. But it was coming along nicely, and it would be ready by the time of the show. I was exhausted from working on it. I just barely had enough time to balance it between classes. Well, little did Doe and I know, 
Wolfbeard had been lurking in the back bedroom. We had been under the impression that he was napping, but I guess he was just laying there in the dark listening to us chatting. Because no sooner did I finish asking Doe how hers was going, Wolfbeard appeared in the living room and answered in her place, as if the question had been for him. I'd love to do something Phantom of the Opera style. My robot is dark and brooding, along with having the most beautiful singing voice. He also plays the organ skillfully. He was supposed to be in the band originally, but his broken heart made him malfunction too frequently. So he was stored away in the attic. He finished dramatically, still using that stupid attempt of a deep voice, mind you. Miss Piggy clapped her hand at her heart and sighed at him sadly. But Doe and I, we just gave each other a, can you believe this crap? Look, feeling particularly adventurous that day, I ventured to interact. That's a lovely backstory for your character, Wolfbeard. But theoretically, costuming for something like that will probably take a while. Are you sure you have enough time to sew it? I asked, raising an eyebrow at the idea. It made me think of him squeezing in front of the sewing machine, and then once it snagged, he would fling it off the table in a fit of werewolf rage. Oh well, I was hoping you'd actually make it for me, since you're so good at sewing. He responded without missing a beat. You can take my measurements now if you like, and the fabric store should be open till 9 tonight, so you should have the time to get the materials. I sat silent and blinking for a moment. So this freaking boob wanted me to not only spend hours slaving over making a costume for him, even when I wasn't done with my own, and to top it off, he wanted me to pay for it out of my own pocket. Doe's eyes were the size of dinner plates, and her mouth was hanging ajar in shock. I had to take a stabilizing breath to remain calm before responding. I'm sorry, Wolfbeard, but I can't make your costume for you. Not even done with my own yet, and I certainly wouldn't have time for another, let alone something that complicated. I really can't afford that. His body sagged and his face drooped in sadness. He was legitimately upset that I turned him down. Then, as sadly as he could muster, as if trying to guilt me into changing my mind, he continued. That's alright, Calamity. I understand. I'll make it myself then. I am a world-class tailor in my own right, after all. I wanted to scream, then why did you ask me to make it for you in the first place? But I knew he was just lying again, so I held it in. More time passed, and suddenly, it was just days before the concert. Doe, unfortunately, wasn't going to be able to make it, due to work and school, and robots were never really Lilith's thing. But Valor and I, we were hyped and ready to go. The band was doing two shows, one on Friday and one on Saturday. Valor and I opted for the Saturday showing, mainly because that was the only day that the band was going to be doing meet and greets, plus photos, and we bought that package. I was happily finishing the last details of my costume when I got a text on my phone. Looking down, I realized it was Wolfbeard, who still had my number, sadly. Thank you, Miss Piggy. He informed me. I got some time off of work. I bought some tickets for the show. I can't wait to see you and Valor there. My heart turned to lead. He sent another message after that. See you Friday, winky face. Suddenly, my heart somersaulted back upwards. I had never made any social media post about which day I was going, and he had assumed the wrong day. With a smile plastered on my face, I pulled out all my fake sympathy, and I responded. Oh, well have fun at the show, but I'm gonna be there on Saturday. I have tickets for the meet and greet, so Valor and I won't be going on Friday. There was a brief moment of silence before he responded again. Oh, the meet and greet is on Friday. I just saw that they changed it on their Facebook. You better go buy a Friday ticket before they run out. I wanted to beat my head on the wall. This lying fool was at it again. I looked down at my tickets, and it clearly stated Saturday. And for good measure, I checked the band's Facebook page. No post announcing a day change. I was feeling a little aggravated at Wolfbeard's attempt to deceive me, so I shot back. My meet and greet tickets say Saturday, and there's no such post. The post was just there. They must have taken it down. Wolfbeard quickly fired back, seemingly not prepared for me to see through his hastily thought out lie. 
I thought the shame of being cornered in a lie would be enough to deter him for a while, but once again, I underestimated the determination of this bionic wolf. Saturday rolled around, and Valor and I had a blast. We got into our costumes, and we met up with some folks for dinner before the show. The place was sort of a geek-themed tavern. It was full of other concert attendees in costume, so we really didn't stand out. All in all, it was a fantastic evening. Things were amazing until we arrived at the venue. The meet and greet was happening before the show, and we had to stand in a special line to get there early to take photos and then proceed to our seats. Valor and I were fairly far up in line, and we started to chat with some nice people when I suddenly felt a large, moist hand grip my shoulder from behind. I nearly screamed before turning around only to see none other than Wolfbeard. He was standing there in his wolf tee, fingerless gloves, and the infamous golf hat. He had a huge grin plastered on his face. I was shocked and horrified to see him there. The weight in my stomach dropped even further when he proceeded to pick up those dumb mimicking gestures and poorly attempting the voice again, this being in the company of our new friends nonetheless. It's great to see you here, Calamity. I decided to buy a ticket for Saturday as well, cause I really want a photo with the band. Yeah, sure. It's totally got nothing to do with making sure you got here on the same day as me. Despite having already bought the tickets for a different night, the fact that he was badly mimicking a band member in front of countless fans of said band, who could clearly tell what he was doing, just made it exponentially worse. Trying to keep him from continuing, I changed the subject. So, where's your costume, Wolfbeard? I thought you were a world-class tailor. His gaze dropped to the street below, his mind clearly buzzing to make up some ridiculous grand story, and he certainly didn't disappoint. I kid you not, guys. Valor can attest to this. He looked me dead in the eyes and said, I had nearly completed my masterpiece. When the most horrible thing happened, I was using my mother's old sewing machine, and on the last seam... The machine broke, and it caught fire. It destroyed my entire costume, and I simply didn't have the time to craft up another one. Like, dude, really? How is it easier to literally craft up some fairy tale about how your sewing machine spontaneously combusted than just tell the truth that you don't actually know how to sew? I would have had way more respect for that, and might have even encouraged you. But instead, we're fed a wildly woven fantasy, and we're expected to believe it? To this day, now whenever my friends and I procrastinate on something, and the other ask, So how is your project coming along? We answer by saying, It was almost done, but it caught on fire, so I've got to start over. So at this point, I notice Wolfbeard trying to osmosis his way into the circle of my friends. I'm so excited to take a picture with the band and with you too. All the while, everybody in the group was eyeing me uncomfortably. So, I spoke up before he could cement his position. Sorry, Wolfbeard. Valor and I just want a photo of just the two of us since we're in costume. Also, you shouldn't cut in line. People have been here for almost an hour waiting. Wouldn't really be fair. He looked wounded by my words. And doubly so when he saw Valor and our new friends nodding in agreement. Perhaps the biggest blow, however, was that the two of our new friends, they were tall and rather cute twin boys. And they were dressed as matching robots. He was probably thinking, Once again, those stupid robot overlords are robbing me of what's rightfully mine. Dejectedly, he dropped his head and slunk to the back of the line. For the next 30 minutes, while we waited for them to let us in, I could feel an intense set of eyes sinking into the back of the line. The few times I dared to steal a glance, I spotted Wolfbeard staring, almost unblinkingly and intensely at me. Sensing my apparent distress, the twins kindly offered to let Valor and I go ahead of them in line. They stood shoulder to shoulder, thus blocking us from view. From there, we got a brief reprieve. We had our meet and greet in peace, and we hit it off with the band as well. They took three different pictures with us, instead of just one that the ticket was supposed to cover. They even complimented the handiwork of my costume, which just tickled me pink. They were all really sweet and genuine people. It just made me like the group all the much more. It wasn't until Valor and I were on our way out to our seats 
that we spotted Wolfbeard making his way up to his meet and greet. He locked eyes with us, and then he did this stupid strut thing to the stage. I imagine he thought it made him look like a rock star. Balor and I could have fled, but the morbid curiosity left us glued in place. And boy did he give us a show. To this day, I still feel so bad for David, the man who plays the spine. If by happen chance you ever read this, please know that I am in no way affiliated with Wolfbeard, and I apologize sincerely for how he treated you. You see, the first thing that Wolfbeard does upon reaching the band, he heads straight for the spine. He ignored the hand that he had stretched out for a friendly shake, but instead, he enveloped him in a crushing hug I know, and dread oh so well. After that, his assault still was not finished. He proceeded to rub his greasy hands all over the poor man's abdominal region. And in the creepiest voice, he made an overly sexual sounding oh. moan. He then loudly announced, You must have titanium under there. And he cackled wildly at his perceived cleverness. Even through the intense theatrical robot makeup, you could read true fear on Spine's face. It was in his eyes, despite the shaky smile he managed to keep on his lips. The whole ordeal was painful to watch. When it came time to take a photo, he then looped his sweaty arm over Spine's shoulder, forcing him to smell the unimaginable horrors of his pits. And he proceeded to pull him close. He did another one of those moans. Then he stretched out his arm that wasn't around Spine's shoulder and pointed at the camera with a handgun gesture. Valor and I hit our cringe limit and we had to flee at this point so that Wolfbeard could not have a chance to catch up with us on the way to the seats. Thank God it was assigned seating. The rest of the night was good and the concert was fantastic but I still have pings of uncomfortable secondhand embarrassment. When I think back on the meet and greet the whole thing left me mortified. I couldn't bring myself to go back to Miss Piggy's for a while after that. The thought of having to come face to face with Wolfbeard again was just too much. However, while I was away, our ambitious Robo-Wolf was hard at work scheming. Even after everything at this point, he had still not processed the fact that I wasn't interested. And he had no plans of giving up on me. And since the aggressive sexual comments and mimicking the character I was fond of didn't work, he had one more trick up his sleeve. Now will be the time to pull out all the stops and try his hand at blatant puppet mastering of mutual friends and emotional manipulation. But that's a story I'll have to get into next time. Chapter 4, Siren of the Lake. Welcome back friends! By now we're getting into the swing of things. As usual, when last we left off, Wolfbeard had once again managed to disgust me and push me farther away than ever before, thanks to his horrendous behavior. You know, by trying to literally become one of my favorite characters so that he could try to woo me, and then nearly sexually harassing said character at a meet and greet. You know, the usual. So time passed, and due to the more discomfort than ever before, I didn't go anywhere near Miss Piggy's place. That was the only way I could avoid interacting with this relentless beard. It was a very beautiful summer, and I was out enjoying time with Valor, Doe, and Lilith. We bought some river lodging tubes and loaded up into one of our cars. Then we would drive out to various lakes and rivers for the day. It was shaping up to be just the summer I needed, especially since I was going to have to deal with what I know would be an especially hellish fall quarter, given that I was about to start my major capstone project. However, Little did I know, darker plans were being orchestrated behind my back at the hands of our golf hat donning puppet master. You see, despite the bad footing he got with Lilith from our first meeting, he had managed to worm his way back in, much like what he had done with me. Once again, Miss Piggy had handed over her phone number. At least that's what hey, Wolfbeard had told her, which only made her dislike Miss Piggy more. He admitted later that he had gone through her phone to read her messages, and he saw the number for Lilith. This was from when I initially set up the meetup weeks back. Lilith, naturally, started on the offensive, but after his countless apologies, and a lengthy handcrafted tragic backstory, Lilith softened toward him. 
You see, Lilith really likes to help people fix themselves. She's been through heck growing up, and as a result, she is extremely empathetic. Even if they were entirely fabricated for pity, she was even working to get her certification to be a counselor. She just wanted to make a difference for people in pain. And boy did Wolfbeard sense this trait. And he worked it as hard as he could. Feeling bad for him, Lilith began chatting with him regularly. Unbeknownst to me, this had been going on all the time that I've been avoiding Miss Piggy's place. Wolfbeard told Lilith, I have to admit, my parents were very abusive. They never gave me any attention. I always feel like I'm not good enough. These are the same parents that doted on him like Augustus Gloop, coddling and praising every action, showering him with gifts and affection every waking moment I've ever saw them. Yeah, I ended up over at Wolfbeard's parents' house with Miss Piggy. This was when I was drug over there for his birthday one year. I will have to tell you about it later. Anyways, this news of his tragic upbringing truly was news to everyone who knew him. With everyone else, he would do nothing but brag about his wealthy parents and that he had him wrapped around his finger. Anyways, so despite being brought up in an abusive home, Wolfbeard also brought out the big guns. This is the single declaration and accusation that sent shockwaves rippling through our friendship group. Wolfbeard had confessed to Lilith that I've been in love with Calamity from the moment I laid eyes on her. I don't want to marry Miss Piggy. I'm trapped in an unhealthy relationship with her. She won't let me leave. Now, to be fair and truthful, he was not entirely dishonest in this regard. As I would later learn, Wolfbeard and Miss Piggy was indeed in a very unhealthy relationship, and she did have her claws sunk into him. To be blatantly honest, I was disgusted and mortified by some of the things that I learned that Miss Piggy was doing. But besides that, Wolfbeard wasn't the sole victim. They were mutually abusive and equally selfish with one another. I suppose I can fully enlighten you on the madness, but that's when I'll have to give you Miss Piggy's feature story. But for the sake of this story, that's more than enough to go on. Now, this was the tipping point for Lilith. She went from disliking and wanting to avoid Miss Piggy to straight up hating her very existence. Wolfbeard's fusion of made-up abuse and strands of truth with Miss Piggy mirrored just the right amount of Lilith's past tragedies that she immediately became protective of Wolfbeard, seeing him like a wounded and broken little brother. I suspect that this scenario was only possible in the first place since Wolfbeard had backed off quite a bit, having learned that Lilith already had a boyfriend. Otherwise, it was quite likely that he would have shifted his sights to her. But, as I had the grave misfortune of being one of the only single ladies in our friends group, he seemingly doubled down his focus on me. Suddenly, when I had plans to go do something with Lilith, Wolfbeard would magically be there too. He'd learn that Lilith had plans, and then he would say stuff like, My depression's acting up. I'm scared to be alone. He put that act on real thick and Lilith would offer an invitation for him to join us. I'm not going to lie, this point of time started to cause some issues in my friendship with Lilith. By the time the Wolfbeard saga was over, our friendship would have made it through one of the biggest trials of our lives. For this, I have vowed to never forgive him, as immature as that may be. The promise Wolfbeard had made me to cut back on the creepiness had all but gone out the window, especially after he felt that he had successfully befriended Lilith. Mind you, he was pretty good at restraining himself in her presence. But the second she turned her back, or left the area to fetch something, he was even worse than ever before. Making gross suggestive comments oh, about me can... and my body, trying to touch my shoulders, to arms, and even grabbing locks of my hair. I told Lilith about it, and she would ask Wolfbeard in turn. But he would put on a show. I'm so pathetic. I don't know how to socialize because of my abusive background. And nothing would ever come of it. As a result, I started to get quite cold and witchy toward him. He had crossed the line, and I was done being nice. He must have finally sensed my disgust with him, as one evening, when the three of us had met up for lunch, he pulled a power move on me. He thought it would be a good idea to first, make his heartfelt confession of love to me, and then attempt to throw my friend Miss Piggy under the bus. He told me, 
Calamity, I'm being forced to stay with Miss Piggy, but you give me the strength to officially leave her so I can properly ask you out. It was way too much for me. I probably shortened my lifespan by tapping into unholy forces for the strength to restrain myself. Rather than saying everything, which I desperately wanted to do, I kept it concise in the presence of our mutual friend. Thank you for telling me this, Wolfbeard, but I just don't feel the same about you, and I never will. I met you as my oldest friend's fiancé and can never undo that first impression. Plus, the way you've been flirting with me relentlessly, all the while still engaged with her, has been a major turnoff. I felt my voice beginning to rise, and I nearly unleashed the gates of hell on him, but Lilith's pleading eyes caught my attention, so I swallowed my rage, and I turned on my heel, preferring to excuse myself rather than cause more of a scene. When I reached my car, I got a text from Lilith. She said, Thank you for not going full Hulk smash on him, since he is in a fragile state. I said I would, and then she said, I'll stay behind and try to convince him to let his feelings for you go and end this continued tension that's making everyone uncomfortable. Deciding to take advantage of my now freed up day, I called Miss Piggy. Hey, Miss Piggy, I need to talk to you. After everything Wolfbeard had said about her, I wanted to hear her side of the story. She, fortunately, she had a short day at work, so she said, You can meet me at my apartment. The drive was short and I was there in minutes. Despite the insensitivity of it, I wasted no time in telling her everything that Wolfbeard had said, his love for me included. Sadness washed over her face, and with a resigned sigh, she finally began to explain her side of the story. She said, Huh, I've known about his feelings for you for a while. I had hoped that since you were repulsed by him, he would eventually give up on it and shift his focus back to me. But, it hadn't, and he had only become more and more obsessed with you. Recently, we had a fight because Wolfbeard had told me that he wanted to break up so he could pursue you, but I refused to let him go. In desperation, I told him since I am the primary signer on the lease, if he left me, I would keep the apartment and kick him out. Regardless if it was a filthy dump, this shouldn't have meant anything to Wolfbeard, as his obscenely rich parents had a massive house, and they would have welcomed him back with open arms. But, Wolfbeard was a proud lupine, and it had been a battle to convince them to let him move out in the first place, despite being a grown-up already, and the idea of telling his parents that he had to come back home, because it hadn't worked out, was too shameful for him, especially since he put so much time into convincing Lilith that they were abusive monsters that he had finally freed himself from. So, out of stubborn pride, he stayed. And out of comfort and convenience, he didn't go through with the breakup. That being said, however, things were not good between them. She started to pick up this game of playing that she was some kind of clairvoyant with future telling dreams, which apparently clashed with his werewolf game. So the tensions grew, especially when she said, I had prophetic dreams of us being married with children and calamity meeting a man from Europe and eloping. As horrified as this picture was, despite this clearly toxic relationship and his growing dislike of Miss Piggy, Wolfbeard still used her for physical intimacy during this time. The epiphany was mind-numbingly sickening, but suddenly, a recent change in Miss Piggy all made sense. Over the last month, she began attempting to change her wardrobe to resemble mine as much as she could. She started wearing darker colors, dyed her hair the same color, and attempted to do her makeup the same way, including black lipstick, which she used to despise, and even started wearing glasses. At this time, I assumed she was just shifting her interest and wanted to adopt a similar look as mine due to her growing closeness with me. But, of course, it could never be something so childishly innocent. No, no. Miss Piggy attempted to appear as the same sort, a morbidly obese Twilight Zone version of myself because it was the only way she could get Wolfbeard to touch her anymore. Excuse me for a moment. I need a moment to violently retch while, while I'm recalling this. Nope. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
I hope you're entertained. I'm dying a little inside right now. Yes, even though Miss Piggy knew all of this, as well as my discomfort toward Wolfbeard, she still would constantly invite me over to the apartment because she believed it was appeasing him and that it would make him stay. After all, if they broke up, she was his only connection to me. Once she was gone, I would be out of his life as well. And if you haven't guessed it by now, the magic sixth sense was her actually telling Wolfbeard when I met in town with Miss Piggy. That way he can miraculously show up and join us. This had been Miss Piggy all along. Now, initially, I was outraged learning all of this, but when she broke down crying, I softened. She wept like a baby, saying, He is my first true love. He had been my pillar through high school. He had been perfect. Our relationship was perfect. We were so in love and devoted to one another. But as soon as we graduated, something shifted. He lost interest in me. He began checking out my friends and flirting with countless women online. He had even started several online relationships, basically telling me that because it was just online, it wasn't real. Never using real pictures of himself, mind you. Always sexy anime men. Or pictures of emo guys from Google. And even though he broke my heart, I'm scared of losing him for good. As frustrated as I was for having been used as a tool in their broken mess of a relationship, the sobbing mass in front of me could only muster up pity in me. Instead of kicking her while she was down, I put my anger aside and gave her a hug. I told her, I understand the pain you're in, but that relationship was absolutely poisonous, and you'd be far better off if you ended it. To my surprise, she sniffled and weakly nodded her head. She even agreed to sit down and talk with him later that night. Well, after a few more days, I hadn't heard anything from either one of them. It wasn't until she invited both Doe and I over to her place later that week that I learned the status of things. It seemed that she actually followed my advice. At least on the surface level, her and Wolfbeard had officially called it off. However, something was still rather fishy. Wolfbeard wouldn't be moving out, or putting any space between him and Miss Piggy, and more importantly, her friends. He planned to stay in her apartment strictly as Miss Piggy's platonic roommate. Ah yes, a tiny apartment with one shared room for non-romantically involved exes? That makes perfect sense. Anyways, this whole situation was super weird and awkward. The dynamic between the two of them was virtually unchanged as when they were together, but whenever they were apart, it was a very different tune from the both of them. Miss Piggy would agonize over how much she wanted him back and that letting him go was a huge mistake. And Wolf feared he'd gripe, saying, I've grown to detest Miss Piggy. I wish I didn't still have to live with her. I can't go back to my abusive parents, though. So he would refuse to move back home. All the while, they were still sleeping with each other. I know, guys. It was a huge mess. Things were as uncomfortable as ever, if not more since his confession. But it really hit the fan one fateful summer day when Lilith and I planned to go swimming at a lake. I was super excited about the trip. It was a bit of a drive, but the lake was gorgeous. It was surrounded by beautiful forested hiking trails, and you could even camp there. Because my hopes for that day was so gloriously high, seeing him sitting in the back of Lilith's car when she came up to pick me up to leave made my heart turn to lead, and it dropped so unbelievably hard, like a sledgehammer. I tried my best to whisper calmly to her, and I asked, Why the heck is Wolfbeard here? on what was supposed to be a trip for just the two of us. She guiltily sighed and said, Last night when I mentioned our trip, he became really sad. He told her, Since the breakup with Miss Piggy, I've been left feeling extremely depressed and alone. He had went in for the kill, capitalizing on her hatred for Miss Piggy. Desperate also to make Wolfbeard feel better and stick one to Miss Piggy, she invited him to join us on the trip to the lake. Lilith did feel a bit bad about surprising me with his presence. She knew I was looking forward to this trip, and how I was generally really uncomfortable with this idea, especially with Wolfbeard pining for me. She said, I will only allow you to come along. 
under the conditions that you swear you will accept Calamity's rejection and you won't spend the whole day trying to change her mind. And most importantly, Wolfbeard, you are not to pout about it. Since he agreed, okay. she let him come. Not knowing he had no intention of keeping his word on the matter, the drive out to the lake surprisingly wasn't nearly as painful as I initially suspected. Unlike every other time with Wolfbeard, he didn't feel the need to butt in or domineer the conversation with fake stories. No, today he was working a different angle. He knew that I knew that he liked me now, and he also knew that I had rejected him. So today's game was to play Mr. Sad and Broken Hearted. Despite the strict no pouting policy, he hardly said a word the whole ride. Lilith and I chatted happily in the front seat. I occasionally glanced back to catch him dramatically leaned against the window, a hand up to the temple of his drooping head. Now and then, he'd catch my eye and respond with a huge, ever so sad sigh before closing his eyes and whipping his head away. Melodramatic as it was, I by far preferred this over his usual behavior, so I paid him little mind. Unlike me, however, Lilith seemed really irked from his direct disobedience and began to grow irritated with him. So we got to the lake. It was amazing. The weather was perfect. The skies were clear. There were surprisingly very few people there, perhaps due to the distance outside of civilization. Lilith and I happily bounded to the forest trail that led to the lake, hands full of blankets and beach paraphernalia. Following behind us was Wolfbeard, sagging sadly and carrying nothing but his own pathetic mass. I didn't mind though. I like to imagine him not even being there. Despite the basic ground rules that Lilith laid out for him, this poor beard couldn't help himself. As he neared the lake and changing rooms, Wolfbeard let out a great sigh and finally spoke. Uh, it's truly a shame. Beautiful days like this, beautiful memories. If you were my girl, we'd make them all the time. I'd make you so happy, Calamity. I really would. I didn't even have to answer this time. Lilith's eyes twitched with anger, and she cut in. Well, like it or not, you must accept that it's not happening. Calamity has already told you that she does not feel that way about you, and you need to respect her wishes and drop it. At this, we left them standing outside. As we entered the woman's changing rooms, I swear I could hear his projected loud sighs ringing through the air as I slipped into my bikini. That man was hell-bent on trying to guilt me into loving him. I almost felt bad for him. But this is Wolfbeard we're talking about, so he got no pity. Let's be real. When we stepped back outside, Wolfbeard was still there, unchanged and pouting as ever. His eyes immediately wandered hungrily over our bodies, and it literally Ooh. took Lilith directing a question at him to snap him back to attention. Why haven't you changed yet? We're going into the lake. He shrugged and looked down at the dirt trail below. I didn't realize I needed to bring one. You never told me to. Even Lilith and her ever-expansive mercy on this fine specimen began to falter. What do you mean? I told you we were going to swim in the lake today. You should have told me to pack one still. You can always drive me back to my apartment. I can call Miss Piggy and she can run one out to me. He offered, as seeing nothing wrong with this proposition. Lilith, however... Looked like she was nearing a breaking point. Wolfbeard, we drove nearly two hours to get here. We're not going to drive all the way back so you can get the swimsuit you should have been smart enough to know to bring in the first place. He sighed and drooped his shoulders further. That's fine. I can always wait on the beach while you two swim. He sadly murmured, expecting us to take pity and not actually do that. But that's exactly what we did. Lilith just shot back at him. Alrighty then. We grabbed our things and just kept walking to the lake. We laid out our blankets on the beach, and while Lilith ran straight for the water, I hung back for a moment to finish applying my sunscreen. It was a big mistake leaving Wolfbeard a brief moment alone with me, and I regret it to this day. Not wasting a moment to pounce, while applying sunscreen to the last portion of my arm, I felt sweaty, pudgy fingers come into contact with the bare skin of my back dangerously close to my bikini strap. I leapt forward, away from the offending hand, and whipped around to face Wolfbeard. 
I was just gonna help you put on your sunscreen, he said, mocking a fence. Lilith already helped me. You were there while she did it. I shot back. I don't know why you're being so cold to me, Calamity. All I've ever done is love you, but you won't even give me a chance. He responded stubbornly. Wolfbeard, I've told you this once before, and I'll tell you again. I'm not interested in dating you. But before I could finish, he cut me off. I know. You met me as Miss Piggy's fiancé, and that makes it feel weird to you. But the thing is, just don't think about her. She doesn't matter. What matters right now is you and me. I'm just asking you from the bottom of my heart, please, Calamity, will you make me the happiest man alive and be my girl? I'm not especially proud of my behavior that day. I let my anger rule me, and I became the living embodiment of witchiness. A hateful Amazon entity, hungry for neckbeard tears, possessed my spirit. I couldn't stop myself. I had reached my limit, and that was that. I pasted the smuggest, most condescending look on my face, and I just laughed. I kept <laughs> laughing. I turned on my heels and walked away, and I looked over my shoulder and responded, I would not date you if you were the last man on earth, so just drop it. I will never be attracted to you. I then promptly swam out to join Lilith in the middle of the lake. She had been popping underwater here and there, so she hadn't caught what happened. But she definitely noticed Wolfbeard's behavior. This giant man-baby had walked over to one of the old picnic tables on the beach, and he strewned his form across the top of the table. He laid stomach down, his face buried into his arms, and his form shook like an earthquake, as though he was weeping. Then she asked, What's wrong? What happened? I finally stopped holding back. Everything I had been feeling for the past month, and had been holding back from saying, came pouring out in a vicious amalgamation of venom and spite. I told her, He had just groped at my back and asked me out again when you were out of earshot. Before going into a full tirade, I didn't know if we were far enough out for him not to hear, but at this point, I didn't care. I said, He is extremely unattractive. It's hypocritical that he, being an obese slob, only lusted after women that aren't, and he pays no mind to, or is even downright nasty about girls who are anything like him. He constantly stinks, he never brushes his teeth, and he puts zero effort into his own appearance, while somehow fancying himself God's gift to womankind. I am sick of his fabricated stories for attention and pathological lies repulse me. I really hate werewolves, because I think they are the lamest of all paranormal creatures. I would rather date a vampire if given the choice. I was going in for the kill, and I knew it, but I just couldn't stop myself. Well, apparently Wolfbeard could hear us, because at the mention of the word vampire and my apparent willingness to bang one of those blood-sucking chads, he got up from the table and stormed off into the woods, howling in a mixture of sorrow and rage, and scaring the crap out of the poor little girls building a sandcastle nearby. For the briefest moment, I felt a little regret and guilt, but the feeling of relief I got from finally saying everything was way too strong. Lilith looked a little sad and worried for him as he ran off, but ultimately didn't reprimand me for the outburst. She understood how I'd been feeling, and despite wanting to help Wolfbeard, she agreed that his lack of respect toward my boundaries was unacceptable. So we simply ignored his little outburst for attention. It wasn't raining, so there weren't any mud puddles for him to lodge himself into. So we swam the day away. It was lovely. We had a blast swimming in the lake, pushing each other off the deck and enjoying a picnic on the beach. I had completely forgotten about Wolfbeard until the sun began to set, and we started packing up with no sign of him. While we carried our things back to the car, Lilith called his cell phone. No answer. Oh well, he can stay here. Uh, okay, that's how I felt, but Lilith was worried. So, after loading the car, I opted to wait in the passenger seat while she headed back to find him. She had her phone out and tried calling him again as she walked away, speaking quickly into the phone. I assumed that she finally got an answer. About 20 minutes passed, and I had lost my patience. I was prepared to call Lilith and ask her to just come back and leave them. Then I spotted two figures moving out of the trail. The sun was nearly set by now, and I was ready just to go home. 
Wolfbeard refused to make eye contact with me. As he climbed into the back seat of the car, Lilith looked at me apologetically while she hopped into the driver's seat. With a sigh, she addressed me. Hey, Calamity. The things you said, they really hurt Wolfbeard's feelings. I sighed. I did have the tiniest pangs of guilt for being so harsh. I realized by now that he must have finally made the connection that I was absolutely never going to date him. So there'd be no harm in offering an olive branch, right? So I straightened up and spoke. I'm sorry for saying such harsh things. I was angry because I felt that my wishes were not being respected. I won't ever be that cruel again. I just want you to understand that I don't want you to keep trying to make me date you. Wolfbeard didn't respond with an apology of his own. He simply continued to stare out the window and only sighed deeper. His running off into the forest didn't attract my pity and the attention that he hoped for. So now he could only pout. He sighed again and muttered oh, under his breath. One day I'll find my princess. She'll be the happiest woman on earth. Don't know why pretty girls always have to be witches. When nice guys are only trying to compliment them, they're always the same. At this, any pity I had for him flew right out the window. And the hateful Amazon returned to my spirit once more, smiling wickedly at the thought of further crushing the will of this pitiful specimen. If he was going to keep on carrying on back there about how much of a witch I was for not hooking up with him, I would show him the full depths of my cruelty this evening. For the remainder of the ride home, I completely ignored his presence. Instead, over the whole two hour drive, I spoke excitedly to Lilith about the metal and punk band members that I found so sexy. Ooh, sexy. How well groomed men with dark and alternative aesthetics were just eye candy to me. And how I would love to get my hands on a big beefy man with carved muscles and a perfect jawline. I'm pretty sure Lilith knew what I was up to because she started to raise her eyebrow at me and shot me a disapproving look as I croned on about all the features I loved in men that Wolfbeard definitely did not have. Sensing that, Lilith was getting tired of this and wanted me to change the subject. I went in to sneak one last jab, just to top it with a cherry. I brought up. I have a guy friend that I met online. I have a huge crush on him. I think he's into me too. I wonder whether or not I should go for it, despite the distance. I never liked long distance relationships, but I made sure to announce that I might be willing to make up an exception because dang, he is so hot. Never in my life have I laid it on so thick, even to this day. It was so out of character for me. Needless to say, the jab hit. I could feel the cloud of furious aura looming the rest of the ride back. He neither spoke or sighed the entire time, simply looked out the window and occasionally shot daggers into the back of my head. I had finally got myself off the radar. I was no longer a pure innocent lady in search of my knight in a shining fedora. No, I was clearly a chad loving witch leading on this poor loyal werewolf until I could fly away with my vampire chad spitting on all the nice guys below as we flew into the night. My ordeal was finally over. Or at least, that's what I thought. You see, I underestimated the vindictiveness of a beard scorned. Wolfbeard had become entirely obsessed with me, so much so that he couldn't stand the thought of me being happy in someone else's arms. So, if I wasn't happy with him, I wouldn't be happy at all. He would try his best to make this a reality. But, you know the drill. That is a whole different story for another time. I'll see you guys later. Stay safe and avoid those vampire chads. They're the worst kind. Chapter 5 The Fall of Wolfbeard Hello dear friends, it's bittersweet to announce that this is the final chapter of the Wolfbeard Saga. I thank you all sincerely for your amazing support and feedback. It's been a wildly and greatly therapeutic experience. So let's send off this mighty Wolfbeard Saga with the craziest twists and turns, and yet, 
Some good old-fashioned retribution. When last we followed our mighty lupine hero, he had been gravely wounded by the dark and cruel milady. No, she was no longer a milady. She is now an evil hoe who dared crush the heart of the nicest gentle sir in existence, all to feed her own sadistic appetite. How could she turn down such a fine creature? Epitome of alpha. A true apex. It must be dark, evil powers, the likes of which he feared to comprehend. Clearly it was witchcraft. And I, the witch, must be punished for my crimes. And that's what he proceeded to do for the next two weeks. Apparently, my harsh rejection had hit him a lot harder than I thought. Again, I admit, I wasn't very nice to him at the lake. I probably could have lifted it, I'm not the slightest bit attracted to you, and never will be, and I will never date you, and your behavior is repulsive, but I did take it a step further. He was clearly coddled since childhood, and he wasn't used to not getting his way, so it was already massively upsetting to him. His ego had been badly bruised, just by my forceful rejection alone, and my vengeful tirade in the middle of the lake likely did nothing more than just add salt to the wound, but I was so full of fury for months of politely and gently telling him I wasn't interested and being blatantly ignored and constantly harassed to the point that I lost control. And let's be honest, it's freaking hilarious that out of every nasty thing I said, it was my preference to vampires, to werewolves, that cut the deepest. Like holy crap buddy, wow. Anyways, I had hurt his feelings so badly that I had finally destroyed his obsession over me. However, with Wolfbeard, apparently if he couldn't have me, then he would be determined to destroy me. His ego needed something to help it recover, and that would be the perfect way. Of course, with his gross infatuation with me finally over, he wasted no time in finding a new target, and the next lucky recipient of his obsession was Lilith. See, since she had been so kind to him, and had even defended him to me a few times, he had taken to seeing her as a being of pure light. Never mind the little boyfriend problem. After all, in the weeks prior, things had been looking rocky. What luck to be there just in time to benefit from her emotional turmoil. And so, Wolfbeard set his evil plans in motion. Plans that would rock our entire friends group for the next two weeks. And almost destroyed it entirely. But you know what they say about weaving a web of lies. Eventually you'll get tangled. And boy, was the aftermath ugly for him. The first thing at the top of Wolfbeard's checklist was to begin driving a wedge between Lilith and I. He had already done all the groundwork by gaining Lilith's sympathy, so he knew the angle to play in turning her on me, and he could already tell that I was frustrated with the way she babied him and defended him, so his wicked little mind knew exactly what to do on my end as well. For the next few times I spoke with Lilith, they were rather tense. He had called her more than once in the wee hours of the morning, sobbing. The things Calamity said to me made me want to kill myself. I was so emotionally weak from my parents and Miss Piggy's emotional abuse, and those words were just too much. She was rather short with me, getting irritated and snapping whenever I mentioned him in a bad light. After one really tense day, she lost it on me, finally telling me, The reason he was so broken and acted so badly is all the trauma that he's been through and had to endure with his parents and Miss Piggy. You're only making it worse and being extremely selfish. He almost tried to kill himself because of it. This was extremely shocking to me. I had met his parents before, and as previously mentioned, they were not wicked people. They doted on Wolfbeard, and they spoiled him rotten. And Miss Piggy, for all of her flaws, was head over heels for this sack of crap. She was never anything less than 100% willing to do anything in her power to please him even at her own expense. My response was to call him out on his bullcrap. I tried telling Lilith about how much of a pathological liar Wolfbeard was, how he made up his own abusive childhood for pity, and that though Miss Piggy was controlling, he was also lying about her. This was a breaking point for Lilith. Now, before I go any further, let me be clear here. You may think Lilith is foolish and gullible, and even a terrible friend for the things she did over the course of this saga. Believe me, I've seen a few comments being highly critical of these points. 
But what you need to understand is that what is logical doesn't always seem to be logical to abuse survivors. I've talked to Lilith recently, and I told her about how I was transcribing our experiences into a story, and she gave me permission to delve deeper into her own traumas, so all of you can not only have a deeper understanding of why things happened the way they did, but also help those unfamiliar with the effects of trauma, and the irrational behaviors and reactions it can cause, and perhaps learn more about it, and better understand survivors that you may encounter in your own lives. See, I briefly mentioned that Lilith had gone through a lot in her past, but not wanting to overstep, I left it at that. But the truth is, the reason why Lilith was so susceptible to Wolfbeard's lies is because she had very, I mean very, recently gotten out of a terrible situation, and it was still fresh in her mind. Wolfbeard said that his childhood was emotionally abusive, and that really hit the mark, because Lilith's childhood genuinely was. To put it frankly, her parents never wanted her, and they'd never been shy to let her know. Anytime anything went wrong, they would find some way to blame her. Even as a young child, things only got worse when her baby sister came along. This time her parents were trying, so this baby was the anointed wanted one. Lilith's childhood was filled with neglect, all the while seeing her little sister spoiled rotten and showered with love and affection. She so desperately wanted, but was never given. This caused her to start acting out in her teen years, desperate for scraps of attention, even if it was negative. But her parents genuinely didn't care. They let her drift. It was up to a literal child to realize that her life was worth more than the choices she was making and get herself clean and out of contact with bad influences that she had befriended, hoping for the attention that would never come. Mind you, they never hit her, but I promise you, being told that you should be aborted and that the divorce was entirely your fault, and that you're a failure, and always will be, hurts just as bad, and it lasts far longer. And as is often the case with abuse victims, they tend to attract more abusers. A slew of boyfriends that beat, assaulted, and controlled her, left Lilith extremely timid and agreeable to whatever men told her to be true, as questioning their authority in any way, more often than not, led to a brutal punishment. Sorry to darken the mood by dropping all of this on you, but I'm sure now you're starting to see a clearer picture as to why Lilith was so easily convinced by Wolfbeard. But this man seemed to be very kind and gentle to her, and he seemed to understand some of what she had to go through, since he supposedly also grew up in a traumatic environment. Lilith wore a ferocious exterior, but during this time, she was very broken inside. And by me calling another abuse survivor a liar, I was essentially calling her a liar too, and that was not something Lilith could handle. What really burns me up to this day is how truly depraved Wolfbeard must have been. What kind of sick jerk can listen to someone who opens up about their horrific traumas and what they've endured, and then lie to them right to their face, making up fairy tales about events that never happened so that they can earn their pity? or worse, prey on them. I'm sure there's a term for people like him, but I haven't thought of one foul enough. Anyways, now that that's out of the way, let's move on. So, after a heated discussion with Lilith, she refused to believe me when I told her that Wolfbeard was a dirty liar. We kind of stopped speaking for a while. At this point, she had not been ready to share the entirety of her abuse with me, so I wasn't aware of the complex reasoning. I was extremely frustrated with her for what I saw as being gullible and willfully turning a blind eye to defend a pig. And of course, for all the reasons I previously listed, she saw me as a super hurtful and insensitive to abuse survivors, and in turn was frustrated with me. Wolfbeard, of course, reveled in the tension he was creating. He began spending more and more time with Lilith, claiming, My situation is growing more dire. I can't be alone. Right around this time, Lilith and her boyfriend at the time finally broke up, which had only added to the cocktail of distress she was going through. And Wolfbeard was madly giddy over the prospect of moving in like a scavenger. Now I can make my move. Lilith had made it clear to him multiple times that she was not interested. I'm not interested. Please stop asking. But we all know how well Wolfbeard takes a gentle decline to his offer, so of course, he didn't drop it. Seeing Lilith's current state from her breakup and her tension with me, Wolfbeard decided to see how far he could push it. 
I'm guessing that's the way he saw it. Since I was disgusted by him, so long as I was friends with Lilith, she'd be influenced by me and would reject him. So end of story. I had to go. He began having tear-jerking conversation with Lilith about, I believe Calamity is aiming to destroy my life. She's mad that you're spending time with me. She's got a bullying campaign against me. Yep, according to old Wolfie, she's manipulating our mutual friends and family members. Even all our online friends are hating me. She's spreading lies about me, and she's telling everyone to say nasty things and ignore me. All absurd fantasies, of course, but it only deepened the rift. Meanwhile, he still had other elements to juggle, so the manipulation didn't end there. So to make sure I didn't eventually catch on and talk sense into Lilith and finally make her understand the truth, he had to make me just as mad at her, so any attempts to communicate would cease. So that's when he started feeding select information to Miss Piggy, whom I was still on good terms with. He knew that she would pass on the information along to me, and that I'd automatically distrust anything that came from his mouth directly, but would lend some consideration to Miss Piggy. He couldn't have me questioning too hard as to exactly why Lilith was irritated with me, so he planned for this. Wolfbeard fed Miss Piggy misinformation about the nature of Lilith's anger toward me. According to him, Lilith is mad at Calamity for not giving me a chance to date her. This made Miss Piggy furious. Even though they had called off the engagement, she still loved Wolfbeard. And the idea of Lilith, one of her least favorite people, spending a bunch of alone time with her beloved and seemingly trying to sabotage her desire to get back together by trying to hook him up with others was maddening to her. And of course, this made me mad a great deal because I felt betrayed. I told Lilith countless times how uncomfortable Wolfbeard made me and to know that she was trying to go against my wishes and force me together with him behind my back was unthinkable. So by this point, Lilith and I were no longer speaking and I didn't know if I could even consider her a friend. Now that that vile task was out of the way, Wolfbeard moved on to the next step in Operation Acquire Goth Girlfriend 2.0. Knowing full well of Lilith's less than flattering thoughts of Miss Piggy and Miss Piggy's mutual dislike, he decided to use this to his advantage. He began to play a new and more intense angle for pity. He began to tell Lilith that Miss Piggy has begun to physically abuse me. All the stress is making me want to hurt myself even more than ever. I'm scared of her. I can't stand living with her any longer. But my only alternative moving back home with my cruel parents. I need even more emotional support and time with you. Even more than ever before if I'm gonna survive. Now, before y'all ask just how the heck he managed to convince Lilith beyond a doubt that he was moving back home, let me tell you the depths of this psycho's plotting. He straight up packed a bunch of his stuff into boxes and had Lilith come help him move him back to his parents' house while Miss Piggy was away at work. His bearded arse went through all that trouble just for a lie. So now, let me recap all the puppet strings that began to tangle up. He had Lilith mad at me for bullying him. He had me mad at Lilith for backstabbing me. And Miss Piggy furious with Lilith about all the extra time that they were spending together. To defuse the latter, he swore. Miss Piggy, I'm not going to hang out with Lilith anymore so I can respect your discomfort. Instead, he would lie to her every time that he met up with Lilith, telling her that My dad called me into work. I have to go. It seemed that the only one that hadn't been pulled by his madness was Doe, Valor too. But she was mercifully back on the other side of the state, so she avoided the whole mess. Wolfbeard didn't know how to begin going about manipulating Doe. She had no pre-standing biases or tensions with him to take advantage of. She had remained neutral in all of this and she was still friends with everyone, and this would prove Wolfbeard's undoing. He decided to try playing both sides by telling her, Lilith is mad at Calamity for being nasty to me. I'm innocent in all this, so I can't understand why Calamity's mad at Lilith, since she's the one being the big meanie head after all. Also saying, I've been spending a lot of time with Lilith, so please don't tell Miss Piggy. Because she doesn't like Lilith, and I don't want to upset her. He had anticipated and planned for a lot, but he hadn't thought out one factor. Everyone he was speaking to separately talked to each other and started to realize things didn't add up. One evening, about two weeks after the tension had started, Doe and I met up at Miss Piggy's house to hang out. As much as I was disgusted by Wolfbeard, I had resigned myself to just accept his presence. And other than sad looks, 
he had finally started to leave me alone. While he was in the shower, and Miss Piggy was cooking something on the one cleared off stovetop, Doe and I chatted in the front room. Then Doe asked me why I was upset with Lilith. She was asking this since Wolfbeard had failed to come up with an explanation for this. I told her. Because Lilith has been trying to hook me up with Wolfbeard behind my back and she's broken my trust. I was surprised to see Doe's baffled expression. She processed my answer for a moment before interjecting. Oh wait, she was what? That's not what Wolfbeard told me. He said she was mad at you for trying to get a bunch of people to bully him and be nasty to him. What? I practically yelped. I was flabbergasted by this. Surely, I had been a bit mean at the lake, but that hardly counts as launching a bullying campaign, and I told Doe as much. At this point, something smelled fishy. My anger with Lilith began to melt away once I realized that the whole thing had likely been schemed out by Wolfbeard, but I knew the only way to clear things up would be to talk it out. But Wolfbeard had her convinced that I was relentlessly abusing him. There would be no way she'd answer my call, or even believe me for that matter, without solid physical proof to show her. At this point, we began to brainstorm. Doe mentioned, Wolfbeard was planning on meeting Lilith tonight, and perhaps I can tag along and try to get a moment alone with Lilith. However, at the mention of plans for the evening, Miss Piggy's radar finally sprang into action, pinging her rapidly into the living room. What do you mean Wolfbeard is meeting up with Lilith tonight? He told me he was done spending time with her. He's going in for an extra shift at work tonight so he can afford to take me out to a nice dinner. Miss Piggy cut in defensively. At this, the remaining missing pieces fell into place, and Doe and I hatched an evil plan to ensnare the vile werewolf in his den of lies. Upon realizing that Miss Piggy was being fed a different story, we decided to push her into action. We explained just how much time Wolfbeard had actually been spending with Lilith, and that he had been lying about work all along. It turned out that he had been using this excuse a lot. She was livid, not with Wolfbeard of course, but with Lilith. And with a little bit of prodding, Miss Piggy stormed off in a violent fervor. She charged into the bedroom, and was out a moment later, Wolfbeard's cell phone in her hand. Apparently, he was still in the shower and left it on the bed. I will always be amazed at Wolfbeard's ability to take longer showers than a woman, but still come out smelling terrible like body odor and cheese. I suppose he thinks water alone is enough? And avoid actual soap. This was back in the day of flip phones, and before Wolfbeard was smart enough to password protect. In seconds, Miss Piggy was speeding through all of his interactions with Lilith over the past two months. Apparently, he had listed her number as Jim, a work associate. But Miss Piggy had already been a bit suspicious, since it seemed that Wolfbeard was spending a whole lot of time chatting with Jim, always with a dreamy expression, nonetheless. As she scrolled, she turned deeper and darker shades of fuchsia, unable to stop herself. And Doe and I chose not to intervene. Miss Piggy sent her own message to Lilith. Giving the length and the feverish speed of her typing, we assumed that it was less than pleasant. In short, she said, Lilith, you're a hall wrecker, and I demand that you leave Wolfbeard alone. We're working things out, and he loves me. Moments later, Lilith responded. Now it was her turn to be angry. And she said, you're abusive and Wolfbeard hates you. He told me himself. That's why he moved out and said he never wants to see you again. Miss Piggy was about to lose her mind at this. She assured Lilith. Wolfbeard is not only still living with me, but we're also still intimate. In turn, Lilith said, Liar! I helped Wolfbeard move out, so I know for a fact he was done with you. This was the last straw for Miss Piggy. Not only was Lilith saying things that conflicted with the story she desperately clung to, but she claimed to have been in her house, despite Miss Piggy forbidding it. Unable to restrain herself, Miss Piggy pulled a power move. Crashing back into the bedroom, Miss Piggy then took a picture of the bathroom, showcasing Wolfbeard's filthy discarded clothes, his toiletries on the counter, and of course, his grotesque silhouette behind the shower curtain in plain view. She then proceeded to send it to Lilith, jabbing, <laughs> Does this look moved out and avoiding me to you? He's naked in my house right now. However, all this commotion finally caught Wolfbeard's attention. After hurriedly exiting the shower and dressing himself in a fresh wolf-themed t-shirt, he spotted Miss Piggy with his phone. At this, he went ballistic. 
He grabbed her by the shoulders and screamed. Why are you spying on my phone, you witch? I genuinely thought he was going to hit her when he raised his hand, but he remembered Doe and I being present. He settled for punching the door and howling in rage. At this, Doe and I protectively yanked Miss Piggy away from him and prepared to throw down if he tried anything. But before it could escalate to that, his phone began to ring. Seeing that it was Lilith's number, he was fast to answer it and tear off into the bathroom, slamming the door behind him. Despite this, we could hear everything loud and clear. He put on his most pathetic voice and begged, Can you give me a chance to explain myself? But it was too late. Lilith had finally put the pieces together and was beyond forgiveness. We could hear her screaming through the speaker, clear from the other side of the door. She shouted, If you can so easily lie about your supposed abuse by Miss Piggy, you can just as easily lie to me about the other abuse. Ugh. And anyone lying about abuse of any kind for attention was a mortal sin in Lilith's eyes. And it was more personal because she has defended his lying butt against friends. Just like that, one simple photo had completely broken her trust and brought about wrath that made my outburst at the lake seem like a gentle pat on the head. I could hear it all because that seemingly endless onslaught sort of merged together from the distance where I stood. I could hear enough to know that Wolfbeard would not easily recover. Terms like disgusting, hideous, repulsive, and pathetic rebounded through the air. And as if telepathically responding to my mental, finish him, she went in for the kill. The reason women don't want to date you isn't because they're cruel and picking on you, Wolfbeard. You're a disgusting, arrogant liar that is so truly worthless, he must make crap up to get scraps of pity attention. You constantly salivate over women way outside your league, but you're a gross slob that's not even a 3 out of 10 on a generous day. No beautiful women will ever love you because you're disgusting both inside and out. You might as well stay with Miss Piggy, since that's about all you'll ever get. Ugh. Fatality. The resounding silence after Lilith hung up from him was so intense that I had to excuse myself. On the way out to my car, I got a massive text message from Lilith. She was overwhelmed by everything that just happened. She was terrified that our friendship would be destroyed over what ultimately amounted to nothing more than a man baby's temper tantrum. She begged. Will you meet up with me for dinner at Denny's tonight so we can talk through everything that has happened? I don't want our long-standing friendship to die over one vile beard. I agreed. That evening was a wild emotional roller coaster. Right from the moment Lilith spotted me, she ran over and hugged me, sobbing. <laughs> Just like that, any remaining irritation I had with her flew right out the window. And I started the waterworks too. <laughs> Funny how Denny seems to be the place where a lot of weird things happen. You just sort of end up there, really. And no matter the wild situation, they're used to it. We walked in, just sniffling and hugging, and the hostess and the other diners didn't bat an eye. We discussed everything that happened. From the various ends during the two weeks we hadn't spoken, it was blatantly obvious just how much Wolfbeard had manipulated us and poisoned us against each other. At this point, all of our anger with each other evaporated, and it was refined and redirected solely at Wolfbeard. He may have thought himself an evil mastermind, and that he was about to get away with the biggest scheme of all time, completely scot-free. But it all horrifically imploded around him in the blink of an eye. And believe me, he felt the consequences. Over the next few days, not a single mutual friend of our social circle was unaware of his actions. He had found himself completely excommunicated, a total pariah, and his already decimated ego took another great hit when he actually was forced to move back with his parents. Miss Piggy was too hurt by the Lilith incident. She demanded he leave, and in that, he seemingly lost his greatest ally and defender, and no one but his abusive mother remained to coddle him like an innocent little baby and ensure him that those big bad meanies were just picking on him, and he had done nothing wrong. Even his online refuge, where he can hide behind the safety of some hot buff anime character as a deceptive icon, was tainted by his actions. He was booted from my group chat, which he had pressured me into adding him, and almost no one would dare to speak to him again. Both Lilith and I did not mince words when we explained to the group why he was banned. We made it quite clear 
that he was a deeply deranged individual who not only constantly sexually harassed every woman he got within 10 feet of, but that he was also manipulative and toxic. And because of this, we were no longer comfortable keeping any kind of contact with him. Just like that, he was instantaneously ghosted by just about every contact he previously had. Harsh as it may be, don't pity the beard. He brought about his own downfall. Besides, aren't werewolves supposed to be solitary creatures? Poor fools should have sided with the bloodsuckers. At least they have an elaborate underworld society. Anyways, after the aftermath of the Wolfbeard experience settled, our friendship survived. As of writing this, five years have passed, and in that time, we've grown older and wiser. Lilith and I are no longer the same innocent and easy to emotionally manipulate little college girls. Time and experience have made us far less patient beings. And we cannot begin to emphasize enough how much less crap we are willing to put up with today. I guarantee you, if all of this was to happen today, it wouldn't even be able to start. Because I would have cut Wolfbeard down the second he started being creepy. And gone on with my life. Because I haven't the time or the energy to deal with trifles. Lilith is also much more difficult to take advantage of emotionally now. She's long since made peace with her past and is in a pretty good place now. She also is in a very healthy relationship with an amazing guy that is living proof that good ones are indeed out there amongst all the trash. But as an unfortunate result of Wolfbeard's utter foolery, she now has a hairpin trigger for trifling and will come for your life if you ever hint at playing with her. So you better watch out. Anyways, our entire friends group has withstood the test of time. Lilith, Doe, Valor and I are still dear friends to this day, minus the exception of Miss Piggy. You'd have to understand the darkness that she had been hiding from us all this time. Thank you very much for joining me on this journey. May your necks be clean shaven and your werewolf hunts bountiful. Godspeed my chads and my ladies, Godspeed. Ah, oh, sad panda.